This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Every accountant likes to get new work. And indeed, if your approach can be very flattering if somebody wants you to be uh, their auditor. But it's important not to go too quickly and to find yourself involved with a client uh, who is high risk, who may damage your reputation and who may end up costing you an awful lot of money. However, <clears throat> not everyone is approached uh, out of the blue by a potential client. Uh, quite often what a firm of accountants has to do uh, is to advertise. And if you are advertising, the ACCA Code of Ethic uh, says that your advert shall not reflect adversely on the profession, on the professional accountant, or the ACCA. So <clears throat> you can advertise your services, but you're not allowed to say, and I'm much better than the other accountants, or I'm the best accountant, or anything of that, or even I'm the cheapest accountant. Uh, because if you're selling yourself on price, then of course there's obviously a kind of conflict uh, about whether or not you are skimping on, on, on quality. <clears throat> if these are mentioned, there are, there are certain rules that have to be uh, uh, followed. Uh, you have to be careful and straight and honest uh, to explain to people for a certain fee what they're going to be getting. Again, the, the, the danger in a way the profession could be brought into uh, kind of disrepute uh, is if you uh, convince someone to come to you because you have a, a, a low fee, then of course uh, skimp on the work, don't do a very good job, uh, begin adding on additional fees for what they thought should have been included anyhow. You have to uh, work out uh, when setting your fee really what uh, stuff do I need, what kind of seniority, how many of them, what sort of length of time are they going to spend on a particular job, uh, so that you get a good audit. Uh, and uh, you multiply those times by their charge out rates and you come up with uh, an estimated fee. The estimate should be reasonable and sustainable and high quality audits should, should be performed. What we don't want, and we'll see later, is something called lowballing where people come in with an artificially low fee to suck in new clients. So here's a, a low balling. Audits are competitive. That means people are competing on price. And indeed, it's, it's generally good for clients if you have a, a two or three firms of accountants competing on price, because competing on price can uh, <coughs> lead towards efficiencies of, of service and so on uh, here. Uh, but uh, you have to be careful uh, if you put in a very low price that you're not hoping maybe for other work and that the low price that you're offering for the audit is not just to get a foot in the door because then of course your independence uh, is being threatened because you want to stay on good terms with that client so that they will reward you by giving you additional work and that's where you hope to make the profit. Audit prices can fluctuate. They will fluctuate uh, according to what the client's doing, but also uh, advances perhaps in auditing technique, the use of computer-aided, uh, computer-assisted audit techniques uh, can enable us to uh, reduce the price. Or if we manage to get internal audit involved in doing some work, again, that can reduce uh, the audit price and, and it can actually become lower over time. External audit costs can also be reduced by clients' actions. You remember in F8, there was a lot of work on internal controls. If the internal controls are very good and just work like clockwork, uh, then really the auditor has to do relatively little work uh, to be reasonably confident that the uh, financial statements are free of material misstatement. But if the internal controls are in a way, non-existence, if the, the accounting system is a complete shambles, then of course the auditor has to do much more work. So if you had a, a client who gradually over time began uh, improving the internal control, and indeed uh, this may persuade them to improve internal control, uh, that you can say, well, 
the price will come down, the fee will come down, uh, because I have to do less and less detailed uh, kind of substantive work uh, to get myself the right level of confidence. We mustn't uh, mislead people about the, the amount of work that's going to be performed. So we mustn't kind of promise uh, the world, so to speak, uh, and deliver a very miserable kind of product. If clients feel cheated, well, uh, they'll probably leave us. It brings the uh, ACCA and the whole profession into disrepute. Uh, and it, it's not something to be uh, in, uh, uh, encouraged at all. Finally in fees is the business of commissions. Uh, sometimes accountants might be asked to give uh, advice maybe on a, a, a suitable uh, accounting system, a small uh, accounting system for a client. Can you uh, recommend one which is right for my size of business and, and, and so on. And sometimes accountants will get a a kind of pre-arranged commission from the seller of the uh, software package. That's okay, but you have to disclose that commission uh, to your client. The client must not be led to believe that this is a completely objective uh, 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 recommendation uh, that you're not being paid for. Uh, you shouldn't be giving a bad reputation, but obviously the uh, whether you recommend package A or package B uh, probably depends uh, or may depend to some extent on whether or not you're getting a commission from one of those vendors. So as long as everything is brought, brought out into the open and a client can decide uh, whether uh, they think that you're unduly influenced by this fee uh, or commission that you're getting from the, the vendor. <coughs> Tendering. <coughs> Tendering means uh, putting in a, uh, uh, a suggestion uh, for the work you're going to be doing uh, and um, really what fees you hope to be getting. What we have to be thinking of is a timetable. New work has to be slotted into existing work. We don't want to upset existing clients or make their audit late. Uh, so we'd have to look at a timetable and put that as part of the tendering document. We have to make sure we have suitable personnel and enough of them, enough seniority and so on. And sometimes for some audits we may indeed need specialists uh, to, to come in and, and uh, maybe do something with the, the tax computations or, 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 or deal with some kind of complicated transactions that most of our staff know nothing about. We have to work out what work is required because unless we know that we will not be able to make any sort of estimate of the time and seniority of staff uh, and therefore no estimate of what the uh, reasonable fee might be. We want to know uh, future plans for the entity. If we're a small firm of auditors and the entity has got huge plans to expand and maybe become a listed company within three years <coughs> and we're too small a company, too small a firm of auditors to deal with a listed company then it's probably not right that we should actually be going for that work because it's going to outgrow us very, very quickly. If a uh, uh, potential client is going to expand abroad and we've got no overseas uh, kind of relationships with other firms of audit again, that's going to cause problem in uh, uh, maybe only a very few years. We also want to know why the auditors are being changed. It could be perfectly innocent. Uh, it could be that the uh, client has outgrown the auditor. It could be that the auditor, a uh, small firm, and they want to retire. And so they want to be cutting down on the amount of work. So perfectly innocent reasons are possible. Uh, however, there are reasons that we should be suspicious of. Uh, perhaps the auditor is being changed uh, because the auditor is too good. Uh, the auditor has found out something that the uh, company would rather it hadn't found out and actually wants to switch to a worse auditor and it hopes you are the worse auditor. Or it could be that the auditor has decided to resign because they have lost confidence in the integrity of management. Uh, so, so we really want to know whether the, the reason for the auditor change is innocent or something uh, which is a bit more worrying. And then we put in a tender document. 
the tender document, a, a typical one, and they, they aren't they aren't formalised, but the typical one is set out in your notes. So so the you, know, you have to tell this client who you are, what your background is, what sort of uh, a size of company you are, whether you, know, you think you can deal with their audit requirements. Uh, you might set out the various departments and specialist areas that you can uh, deal with. Uh, you will set out some sort of a audit plan for them to look at. Here's how we're going to be doing the audit. And here's what the fee is. Here's our projected timing of the audit. Here's when we think you can get your financial statements you know, fully approved. Uh, here's what we think the fee is going to be. Here's uh, maybe the way we think we're going to be getting internal audit involved and so on. So, so it's a, it is a selling document, but it has to be a truthful selling document. Uh, you, you are saying, you know, here's why I think I should be the auditor, uh, but don't make uh, claims within that that can't be substantiated, uh, or, or don't exaggerate capabilities uh, which can't be lived up to. If the client says yes, uh, which is which is kind of good news, but we have to hesitate again. We may even have hesitated actually before we put in the tender document, uh, rather than waiting until the client said yes. But at some point in this process, you really have to go through the following sort of uh, checks. First of all, you have to make sure that you are professionally qualified to act, that you can be an auditor for that company that it is legal for you to do so, and that it is ethical for you to do so. So there is no point uh, trying to be an auditor uh, of a company where you're the partner and your brother, for example, is a finance director, because the family relationship in there uh, would mean that it is unethical. You have to make sure that you have sufficient resources, uh, staff, time, uh, time at the right time of the year in which you can fit in this additional audit. Uh, do your staff, you may have the numbers, but do they have the expertise and the competence? Do they have the experience? Maybe in a particular sort of audit. So you could be perhaps uh, trying to win an order of an insurance company, but insurance companies are really quite specialist. And if you'd never audited an insurance company before, uh, then you're going to be in, in some difficulty perhaps persuading people that you went into that showing professional competence and due care. You want to obtain references about the company, particularly the directors. And, and many larger firms of accountants keep databases of directors. Uh, they will know which other firms that these people have been uh, directors of. And if you see a pattern where there's a director of a company that goes into liquidation, a week later, another company starts with the same director or set of directors, and a month later goes into liquidation, each time leaving kind of creditors unpaid behind them, uh, then maybe you should think rather carefully about getting into relationship with this sort of uh, serial uh, liquidator, if you like. You also want to look at, uh, well, in the UK, we can look at what are called court judgments. Uh, so if a director has been found guilty uh, of, uh, say, not paying what was uh, supposed to be paid or uh, was found guilty of some sort of tax uh, offence and so on, again, there is evidence there of a lack of integrity and you'd be wise to stay clear. Because with a lack of integrity comes greater risk and with greater risk there comes uh, the possibility of reputational damage to you. <coughs> There's something called politically exposed persons. These are people who are or who have been prominent in public positions. Basically, politicians uh, high up in the military, high up in the civil service. And you have to investigate these people very carefully because unfortunately, with a lot of these politically exposed persons, uh, there is a history uh, of not being completely honest. There is a history of embezzlement uh, and on of maybe stealing funds from uh, uh, a country or of taking bribes, you know, on the award of a large defence contract, something of that sort. And again, this may come back to haunt you. 
so how would you feel uh, if you were the auditor of a company, were the chief executive uh, officer, uh, was in a couple of years found guilty uh, of corruption, of embezzling, you know, $10 million uh, from the country's economy. Is the accounting uh, framework acceptable? We have to look at that. There are money laundering regulations, which we'll see, I think, in the next chapter. Money laundering regulations mean, again, you have to know your client. You have to know where they got the money from, you have to know, is their business, does it make economic sense, or is money seeming to be generated out uh, almost magic? Uh, and if it's money seems to be coming out of an almost magical system, the chances are the money is not coming from a magical system, but it's coming from the proceeds of crime. Uh, and you as the auditor can get into really serious trouble in many jurisdictions uh, if you're found to be uh, uh, overly associated with that sort of a company. You want to look at the credit rating of the client because of course you want to be paid. Uh, and then finally you have to go through a, a kind of a little bit of a dance uh, where you uh, uh, contact the previous auditor. So the flowchart which you've probably seen before is something like this. So we're going uh, down this and we're saying let's assume this is not the first client, that the uh, first auditor, the auditor is being changed or the second auditor is something of that sort. So we we'll go down here, no it is not the first audit. You have to ask this prospective client permission to contact the previous auditor because of course there is a confidentiality relationship between an auditor and the client. So first of all you ask the uh, 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 client, can I contact the ex-auditor? And if you get the answer no, then you decline the appointment. It's far too dangerous. Why would the client stop you, forbid you, from contacting the retiring auditor? If you get yes, uh, then uh, you uh, have uh, to write for information. And the old auditors have to write to their old client again because of confidentiality they have to write to their kind of ex-client to say can I communicate with these new auditors so the client is basically being asked twice to give permission uh, uh, first of all the new auditor asks can I contact the old one and secondly the old auditor asks and says can I contact the new one? And again, if you get the answer no, don't go ahead. Why would the client forbid the old auditor from talking to you unless it's something to hide? Assuming you get relevant uh, information, then you can add that to the other evidence you have, uh, which is helping you to make the decision whether or not you want to go for this new business or not. If uh, relevant information is not provided, and, and it should be, because really it, it's part of the uh, almost the etiquette between uh, accountants, then you may have to use other means of trying to find out the information you really want to know. Preconditions for an audit, just very, very quickly. Uh, here, unless these preconditions are met, you would simply not go for an audit. First of all, there has to be an acceptable reporting framework. And secondly, you have to be convinced that management in the new client know their responsibilities. They know their responsibilities for the preparation of the financial statements. It's them, not you. They know it's their responsibility to have a good system of internal control uh, and, and that they exercise expertise and competence. Uh, and, and, and finally, they must agree and know that they have to provide you, as the auditor, with all the information you require and to let you see any documents that you require, whether it's contract, board minutes, correspondence with customers, absolutely everything should be open to the auditors. Engagement letters. Engagement letters are, in essence, a contract between the auditor and the client. 
They will uh, define auditors and management's responsibilities. You prepare the financial statements. I will audit them. You design and implement the system of internal control. I will examine it to make sure it's working and I will report any weaknesses uh, to you. You're responsible for counting the stock. I might come and watch you count the stock. Uh, you're responsible for making sure all the liabilities are uh, included and I will try to, to, to verify that all the liabilities are included. It is uh, written evidence that the auditor has accepted. Uh, the letter of engagement would be sent to the board or the audit committee uh, before the uh, audit is uh, commenced really. And, and if there are any other reports uh, required in addition to the ordinary audit report, really just as a matter of contract, they would be included as well in the letter of engagement. So that everyone knows what's expected of them. They must contain uh, the objective of the audit, and that will be saying stuff like it is to give you reasonable assurance uh, that the financial statements are free of material misstatement. It may well go into saying that uh, we, we do our tests on a on a, on a sample basis and we can guarantee finding every misstatement or every fraud and so on. It will say management's responsibility, as I said already. It will mention the applicable uh, reporting framework and it will mention the form and, contact, uh, form and content uh, of any report to be issued. Those elements must be in the letter of engagement. The following will normally be in the letter of engagement. So, test nature, uh, that there are uh, in inherent responsibilities really, and indeed inherent dangers that we might not find every misstatement. That we expect to get written representations from management, stating uh, elements like we are not aware of any fraud, uh, we are not intending to close down any part of the business. We think all liabilities have been included. Uh, we are not aware of any lawsuits that haven't been admitted to and the like. We will say to them that the audit report is confidential, meaning that it's between me, the auditor, and the members of the company, that the audit report is not to be relied upon by third parties. We'll look more at this when we get onto something called auditor's liability. Uh, but if this is in the engagement letter, it helps to narrow down and make more precise who can rely on an auditor's report. It will mention fees, it will mention planning arrangements like when and where and who will be taking part in the audit. Uh, and it may get into uh, looking at the use of experts uh, and the use of internal control in, in internal audit and so on to carry out certain bits of the audit.